everybody. I'm Sid Melcher. I'm executive director of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts, and we're delighted to have people from across the country for our third Instant Issues Online. We are still learning some of this tech stuff, so I apologize in advance if uh, things are a little awkward at some point. Our Instant Issues series is sponsored generously by Glen Meadow. Greenfield Savings Bank, Wilbraham and Munson Academy, and Sir Speedy. Um, with special thanks to Concilium Opus for helping to underwrite our Zoom account. Our speaker today is a longtime friend and former member of the council, attorney Masa Kanbabai. She was born in Iran, but raised here in Western Massachusetts, attending Wilbraham and Munson Academy and returning to this area to live and work as an immigration attorney. Uh, for many years before relocating to Eastern Massachusetts, where she established the uh, Kanbabai Immigration Law. Uh, Masa has been an active member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association for over 20 years and currently serves as the chair of the New England chapter and is a member of the AILA Department of State Liaison Committee. In her capacity as a member of the Congressional Liaison Committee, she has worked closely with congressional offices to advise on legislative policy, and as a CPB liaison, worked with CPB officials on issues related to visa entry at airport and border posts. She is an active member of the International Medical Graduate Task Force, an association of immigration attorneys specializing in physician-related immigration. She has appeared on national news media outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, and very recently, American Public Media's Marketplace. She has published widely, including two recent pieces in Ms. Magazine on the issue she's gonna to talk to us about today. Uh, she has spoken to us a few times, most recently about two years ago on the human face of the Trump administration's travel ban. Today, she will be speaking on, can the coronavirus cure a broken immigration system? Um, I'm going to duck out for about 20 minutes so she can speak and then I'll be back so she can answer your questions. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. So take it away, Masa. Thank you so much, Sid. It's great to be back again. I'm very fond of uh, the World Affairs Council and especially Western Mass having grown up there. So it's great to be here with all of you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm hoping that this works. Uh, well, so forgive uh, any technical difficulties, but I think it's working now. Um, I'd like to talk to you all about um, our immigration laws and the opportunities that COVID could have presented in trying to uh, improve our immigration system during such a difficult time. Um, and sadly, I think most recently we all saw yesterday with um, the newest visa restrictions that has not been happening. Um, so, uh, I'd like for this to be a conversational type of situation. I'm not really going to be lecturing you. It's, it's really kind of just talking about some of the things that have been happening with immigration law uh, in these past four years. And uh, I'd love to, you know, field questions and we can do that at the end as well. But if there are things that come up, please do put it in the chat function. So as we know, immigration has really become so politicized, so vilified uh, under this administration. Uh, it's been, you know, from, from the campaign trails, a, a scene of fear, right? Where we've been talking about hordes, uh, criminals, people with rocks and guns, people taking away our jobs. Uh, and, you know, the reality we, I think most of us know is that's not the case. The reality is that immigrants and migrants are people and families just like you and I, people who will go to desperate, unbelievable, you know, sad measures to protect their children from danger, from violence, uh, and come to the United States hoping that they'll be able to find some protection here. Uh, you know, beyond uh, what we've been seeing at the borders with children being put in cages and family separation, we also had the Muslim travel ban. And uh, during the campaign trail, you know, Donald Trump called for a complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. I mean, th that actually even goes beyond visa issues, but uh, we're going to stick to this uh, immigration context right now. 
And so, you know, sadly, what we saw, um, we, what we continue to see because of the travel ban and what we don't know yet, but years in the future we'll see is that there's been drastic impact on the immigrants being able to come to the United States, particularly from Muslim countries. You can see from the chart here, the numbers have just uh, dropped stagger in a staggering level. Um, but, you know, we've seen it also affect you know, U.S. citizens, people trying to obtain citizenship for their children. We have, uh, you know, the most recent win, which was uh, in the press uh, probably months ago now, where a gay couple adopted a child and the U.S. government was refusing to give that child U.S. citizenship as the laws require. And the family had to sue to get this child uh, U.S. citizenship, and, and that should not be the case, right? We actually also have reports of the denaturalization task force uh, having a much higher number of investigations than has ever happened in our past. So we're seeing lots of issues and problems on many fronts, from people entering the United States to those that are already here in the United States. And a lot of the context is all in terms of law enforcement and national security. And we've seen that, you know, for, for decades now, where the government couches different types of discriminatory behavior based on perceived national interest concerns uh, or law enforcement concerns. And the funding is there. These agencies have the capacity, have the technology, have the funding to be able to protect our country and have been doing so. So I'm not really sold on, you know, how the vilification of immigrants uh, is, is being presented. Uh, talking about some of that funding, you know, the, United, the White House has spent billions of dollars of funding on the border wall and when we know that not all of that is necessary and, and the numbers are just staggering, especially at a time like now when we have a global pandemic, something that hasn't been seen for basically a century now, where this funding could be used to help us as Americans uh, instead. And that, that all leads to jobs, right? We have uh, young people, we have our schools, suffering from lack of funding. I actually just was at my town meeting the other night where we had to slash our budget, and not only from the schools, but from law enforcement, from infrastructure. And it's all been couched in the context of, we're protecting American jobs from immigrants. We're going to stop them from coming in so that we can protect uh, you know, our jobs. When frankly, uh, the, the state, the data and statistics don't show that and other countries understand that. There is a series of talent wars happening now globally from countries between Britain and Europe and Canada and Australia who are taking advantage of America's uh, targeting of immigration, its attempts to limit and reduce immigration and so that they can attract the top scientists the top entrepreneurs of the world uh, to, to come to their countries so that they can create jobs there because they understand the, the facts and the data and the statistics that show that immigrants really add to our economy. They actually create jobs. And so I have some examples there on the slide from you know, Chobani to, um, I'm just gonna minimize this here, to Google, to Apple, and uh, who, you know, these are companies that have created thousands and thousands of jobs and directly and then indirectly as well. Now, one particular area that the data and statistics have shown now for decades is the United States has a significant shortage of healthcare providers, particularly physicians. And this is really important because of a number of things. One, you know, again, going back to education and, you know, propping up our education system to better train Americans who can go into some of the more complicated healthcare 
uh, positions that are desperately needed, such as physicians and nurses, but also respiratory technicians, x-ray technicians, ultrasound techs, and, and, and I'm not even counting all of the researchers uh, that come from other countries here. But our education system is lacking, and we're therefore forced to rely upon immigrants from other countries to come here and uh, fill those much needed critical jobs. Uh, our elderly population is growing and our need is going to grow to have more healthcare providers available. And you know, we're seeing that countries such as Japan who have historically had incredibly strict and restrictive uh, immigration laws are now uh, loosening them because they see that their economies have not expanded and they have not created new jobs. They have an elderly population that needs people to care for them and they're no longer in the workforce. And so the trends and the data all show, um, you know, that what we're doing here in the United States and restricting immigration is not working for us. And so we see this really epic battle taking place in the White House and in Congress um, and the um, presidential proclamation that was, announced yesterday, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit more detail, has actually been delayed now for a number of weeks. We expected it to come out roughly two, three weeks ago, but it was delayed because there was this um, very intense battle from um, within the Republican Party itself, saying that restricting immigration and, and not allowing people to come on highly skilled visas is going to cause pain and suffering for American businesses. And so finally, though, we saw that um, you know, the hardliners, uh, the Steve Millers, who are looking to essentially cut all kinds of immigration to the United States, won out. Um, I have a list here for you of some of the different um, travel bans and visa restrictions that have come into place. So obviously we had the January 2017 bombshell of the Muslim travel ban. Uh, then in January of 22, that travel ban was expanded to include seven other countries, mostly for African nations. And then with COVID-19 uh, crisis beginning, we saw that in January through March, there were a number of travel bans related to specifically countries that had high breakouts of COVID-19, initially China, then Iran, and then uh, the European region. But things took a drastic turn uh, in April when the administration, uh, under the cover of you know, COVID-19 and protecting American jobs, said, we're not gonna let immigrants in anymore. Uh, people who've been waiting in line, either being sponsored from their families or from their um, employers were told, sorry, you're not going to be able to continue your case anymore unless you actually already have your approved green card or your approved um, visa in your passport, uh, we're not gonna let you in anymore. And that was incredibly devastating for many, many American businesses and families as well, because oftentimes it can take years for someone to you know, weave their way through the immigration lines to be able to come to the United States. So it was a devastating blow come April when, you know, green card processing overseas was put on hold. Uh, it didn't affect people who are already here in the United States on temporary visas and are going through the process. So it's an important distinction. Uh, it didn't limit people that were here, for example, students who have now graduated and, and have work visas and are being sponsored by their companies for green cards. But if that student happened to have been overseas for a semester or for a year and decided to you know, work, let's say, in Germany or in China or in Brazil and take a year off before they started their green card process, now they've been banned from doing so. Um, and then the most recent one was the one that was announced just yesterday or excuse me, two days ago. Um, that is a temporary uh, ban on uh, individuals in certain categories to come to the United States to work. Uh, those categories that were impacted uh, were the H-1B, which is a specialized work visa category that's mostly used by very um, innovative, high-tech, 
uh, highly skilled uh, companies that need highly skilled workers. So it could in impact people in the healthcare field from physicians right now, for example, who are stuck overseas and unable to get their temporary work visas to come here to engage in their medical residency programs or to start their jobs ever after finishing their residency programs. It's also affecting uh, multinational entrepreneurs. So Volkswagen, you know, all of the, the, the top na names that you can imagine, when they have branches here in the United States, they want to try to send their multinational executives, their specialized engineers to come here for periods of time before they return to their home country. That category has also been uh, put on suspension. That's the L1 visa category. The other category that was impacted is the J-1 category. Now the J-1 visa itself actually has seven categories within it and only some of those uh, have been subject to this ban. And that's some uh, lesser, let's say, uh, you know, degree required positions like camp counselors, au pairs, things of that sort. But then it also affects uh, people that are coming here for the summer work study program who they're really not taking jobs from Americans because these companies have tried for months and months or years sometimes to recruit particularly young people to come and fill these summer work exchange programs that are not only important for those businesses such as here in the Cape uh, or other parts of the country that rely on these young summer work exchange students, but these programs are meant for students to be able to come here to experience America, to learn what is it like to work at, um, you know, an ice cream shop down at the Cape or to work at um, a resort in the Berkshires, and then they go back to their home country to finish their college education, having experienced what it's like to, to live and work in the United States. So that program has also been suspended. Um, and then lastly, the H2B, which um, is a seasonal work uh, program that affects particularly restaurants in the Cape, uh, or ski resorts, for example, in the winter time. And um, it's a visa actually category highly used by the Trump administration um, for their golf resorts. Uh, now, of course, they've already all come here, so uh, they're not going to be affected by that. Um, but it's, it's really sad to see that these categories were targeted under the guise of um, you know, protecting American jobs when the data shows um, otherwise. Now, um, you know, how can this be dealt with? You know, what, what were the opportunities that this administration has missed uh, in light of COVID-19 and how COVID-19 has changed our workplaces, our businesses, our daily lives? Um, so there's two primary areas that I want to talk about. Um, one is how, to, how, to, how the legislature can make changes to modernize our immigration laws. So many of you might have heard decades now where our immigration system is broken. Uh, there have been times where there was really great efforts uh, on a bipartisan basis to try to improve our immigration laws at the time that, for example, John McCain uh, made great efforts with the Democratic uh, partners to try to reform our immigration laws because it's been you know, over 40 years now where there's really been no, or 30 years now, no significant reform. And, and the world has changed. Our economy has changed. And how people work has changed. Um, not everyone really wants to come and live in the United States. There is a very large segment of workers here whose only goal and intention is to come here to work temporarily, to fill a need that American businesses have, and to then to return to their countries where their wife and their children or their spouses and, and their families are. Um, we see that in the farm and migrant worker industry. Um, but then we also have individuals who are working remotely, who are just traveling here on short-term visas and have meetings and then return to their country. And then most significantly, what we're seeing is, you know, with the tech sector, uh, the innovation that's taken place 
particularly coming from young students who are graduating from some of the top schools in Massachusetts, for example, from WPI to MIT, who have fantastic ideas and want to create new businesses, but there's no visa category around that really fits them. Um, there was an entrepreneurs in residence program that um, the Obama administration tried to and put together, but unfortunately, the Trump administration has really shot that down. And so I see in my work, for example, with MIT Sandbox, which is basically an entrepreneur in residence program uh, that allows MIT students who have ideas for new businesses to cultivate those ideas and to talk to attorneys for free to get some advice to understand how it best, how they can best make their ideas work. Um, in different legal contexts. And of course, you know, the immigration context is, is tremendous. And there really is no great category to allow an entrepreneur who wants to start a business and hire Americans to get that going. So there's tremendous opportunity now uh, to have taken that um, step, to have the parties come together to work on this and legislate for new visa categories and to reform some of the ones that are just really antiquated uh, right now. And that, unfortunately, has not been happening as we can see. The second category is where the administration itself, the executive branch needs to create sound policy that is not only going to uh, help our economy, but also to save tax dollars. Uh, we're seeing tremendous amount of waste in the Department of Homeland Security in particular uh, in that processes and procedures in reviewing visa applications have um, you know, become extremely inefficient, uh, very time consuming, and have ended up now costing the agency millions and millions of dollars such that they've run out of the surplus that had been accumulated under the last administration and are now actually becoming a public charge themselves in going to Congress asking for a bailout. And uh, what's happened in these three years that caused an agency that had millions of dollars in surplus to now be asking for handouts? Um, it's, it's pretty simple. We see that uh, streamlined processes have not been put in place and that would allow visa processing to take, uh, uh, to move forward and for cases to be adjudicated instead, you know, much higher timeframes. And also we've seen mass incarceration of individuals whose only violations of the law were immigration violations, that they have not had any contact with law enforcement or posed no danger to society. And none of them, or many of them are not being allowed to uh, leave jail uh, because they, the, the government is not instituting much more efficient means such as ankle bracelets, or bond that would then require this person to post money and present themselves at court. And so we're seeing that billions of dollars are being wasted in very inefficient uh, processes and policies. And what's most amazing about this is that with COVID-19, it's extremely dangerous for these individuals to be in such close quarters. So there's a public health and safety issue that is not being considered all in the name of you know, the vilification of immigrants in wanting to uh, have a certain policy, have a certain stance to attract uh, and maintain a base of supporters and voters who have been, you know, unfortunately provided wrong, uh, incorrect information and uh, creating this sense of us versus them rather than understanding the benefits that immigration and immigrants bring to our country and modifying our laws, improving them, modernizing them to better benefit all of us. Now, um, that's the end of my formal presentation at this time. Um, yeah, great. So we could go ahead and you know get started with a Q&A session. I'd be happy to talk to you all about some of the different you know, travel bans that have come up or some of the particular industries that have been impacted by COVID-19 and, and the travel restrictions um, in the immigrant community. I, I didn't really get into how the millions of individuals here in the United States 
who are um, you know, out of status, who no longer have a valid visa and have been unable to legalize based on the very restrictive laws, how they've been impacted. And of course, you know, we, we've heard a lot about uh, those sectors when it comes to you know, the farm workers, to the grocery store uh, and delivery, or the delivery workers that take all of the produce and, and deliver it then to the grocery stores, to you know, a lot of the people that work in the back end of the grocery stores who are here without status. Um, and there is a large sector as well when it comes to home health aids. Uh, in Massachusetts in particular, for example, in Worcester, we know that there's a very large population of home health care aides who come from African nations who are having a very difficult time trying to maintain their visa status, ha have a difficult time in trying to obtain permanent residence and citizenship for a number of different barriers in their way. So um, there's so much I, I could talk about, but um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see what are some of the interests that all of you have. Uh, are there some particular areas you'd like to know more about? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause here. Okay, we have uh, one question from John Lynch. Uh, you showed a slide during uh, the talent contest showing UK, France, etc. I'm curious if anyone has studied the net effect of differences in Canada's immigration policies um, that has benefited their economy and society in general at the expense of U.S. interests? Yeah, so there is actually, a, um, that's, a, that's a great question. There is a wonderful um, you know, organization called the Mass uh, Migration Policy Institute, excuse me. Uh, the Migration Policy Institute ha uh, studies immigration and migration not only in the United States, but worldwide. And their website and all of their materials and their studies, at least in a condensed version, are available for public view. And um, they have done a number of studies, not only related to how immigration has impacted the United States, but also how it's impacted other countries, how these other countries are taking advantage of uh, the negativity towards immigrants in the United States to then attract them to other countries. So yes, there are definitely some studies out there. I urge you all to look up the Migration Policy Institute, just Google them, and you'll be able to see some of their studies. It's, it's really fascinating. How challenging will it be for a new administration to simply roll back these changes and implement new ones? Are there roadblocks in Congress and the Justice Department? Yeah, that's a, that's really something that we're all grappling with and, and praying. You know that come November we're going to be able to to undertake that that those heavy difficult changes. So um, yes, they these are changes that can be instituted by a new administration. Um, some of them are executive, you know, policies, and so those are easily rescinded by the new president. And when it comes to the uh, agencies themselves, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, uh, the changes there are gonna be a little bit more difficult uh, for a number of reasons. Now, it will be easy to rescind some of the policies that have been put in place that have said, for example, we want to detain anybody who's here without status, regardless of whether or not they pose a public uh, a health or safety concern. Um, so some of those are, cha are, are easily changed, but the culture, the training that's been taking place, you know, the culture change and the training that's been taking place these last few years are going to be a little bit more difficult to change. And so one example, for ex uh, one example is that under this administration, the training of immigration benefits officers. Those are the officers that sit at local immigration offices from Boston to you know, New York to Albany um, to Lawrence, for example, that interview individuals that have applied for an immigration benefit. For example, if I were to marry somebody and wanted to sponsor him for a green card, 
we would then go to an immigration office in Boston and have an interview with an immigration officer that would adjudicate our benefits application and determine, okay, yes, you two are, are um, have married. It's, it's a valid marriage. It's not a fraudulent marriage. And therefore, I'll approve your green card. Those officers that are interviewing those cases, as well as the citizenship cases, have um, undergone significant training with a law enforcement mentality. And as we all know these days, right, law enforcement training has not been very open and, and, and welcoming to people of different cultures and races. And so we're seeing significant changes in how interviews are being conducted by these officers, what is their thought process, um, you know, how they're being, for lack of a better word, um, indoctrinated um, to think that everybody is committing fraud. And so that culture, those trainings will all take time. And so I think we're going to see, unfortunately, these negative, uh, this negative impact uh, coming you know, over the coming years and that it's gonna take time to change that and, 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 and assess how, how that can be better improved. Um, we're hoping for more questions to come in, but um, that made me think I just recently finished reading um, The Windrush Betrayal by Amelia Gentleman, which is actually about the situation in the UK, which is different from here, where there were, um, you know, a, a generation of people who were brought legally because they were they were um, citizens of the Commonwealth when they were children, and then 20, 30, 40 years later were being pushed out. And one of the things that they talked about was that originally the department that handled that had always been, how can we help? And then that was changed over to a, a, a culture of you need to prove that you're, you know, you need to prove that you're here legally when nobody saved the documents that they needed to save for that. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't stress enough the, the issue of education and, and how important that is to all of these things that we've talked about today. Um, because if we took those billions of dollars that we were spend that we're spending on the border wall, uh, including try five hundred million dollars to paint it black so that it would attract the sun and heat and scald people's hands if they try to you know get through or over the fence, if we took that money and invested it in our schools, we would be preparing our young people for a future with jobs in technology and STEM. And we wouldn't then really need as many uh, immigrants to come here and fill those jobs. Uh, so, you know, there's a huge disconnect here between what the administration is saying and, and what, how that would really play out in reality and how we can really reuse our resources to help Americans uh, take on these jobs of the future, these jobs of now, where, where they can't because they don't have the education uh, to do that. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, DACA was recently protected by the Supreme Court. Do you anticipate any other immigration policies being challenged in the Supreme Court in the near future? Yeah, um, I do. I, I, the DACA win was really significant uh, and, and, and relieving eh, for so many, but um, I'm still concerned about that because <laughs> I don't know if any of you actually saw, there was an incredibly uh, propaganda-like announcement from the federal agencies, CIS and Department of Homeland Security, talking about how the Supreme Court made an unlawful decision. It was mind-boggling, uh, let's say. <laughs> um, and so what's significant about that is it shows that their intent is to destroy that program no matter what. And they were only stopped from ending DACA because of procedural issues that this administration has sought to cut so many corners to not follow the rules and, and sought to terminate DACA without going through normal procedures, which, in, which involve public comments periods, right? Announcements and, and time for the public to comment. In fact, the administration has already said that it intends to terminate several more programs on an emergency basis, meaning that they are not going to provide normal standard, you know, due process 
public comment period and instead try to, will try to rush it through and terminate it um, in, a, in a very expedient fashion. So yes, we're expecting many, many more problems uh, in the coming months. And especially as this president becomes more and more desperate, uh, he's going to be trying to do more and more um, wild and crazy things to, to try to, to, to protect himself and to distract from the lack of PPEs, the lack of education, lack of infrastructure funding, all of these things. Uh, so here's a question from uh, former WMA head of school and former World Affairs Council board member Rodney Lebrecht. Have these policies affected international students who wish to study in the United States? Yeah, um, yes, it, it will significantly uh, impact them, uh, not per se as part of their ability to obtain the F-1 visa. That category was not impacted uh, in this recent ban. Uh, could there be another one and, and, and that affect them? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but it will impact them in their abilities to, once they graduate, uh, obtain what we call OPT or optional practical training, which allows them to work here for a one year period of time. Um, and then it'll impact their ability to get a temporary work visa, the H-1B, um, should they decide to, to travel or if they're out of the country currently. So the way this current ban was written and some of the other uh, ones were written is it carved out an exemption for those students or those individuals who are here in the United States currently. Uh, so the, the effects will be seen, maybe not immediately because it's the summer right now, but come the fall and next year, yes. And Sid, I don't know, I'm going to just move and shut that door. There's a little bit of noise coming from outside okay. while you check to see if there's any other questions. Anyone else? Sorry about that. So I, all right, last call for last questions, anybody? Okay, so I think we're gonna let you go, but I wanna say again, thank you to you for participating and thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in. Our next Instant Issues Online will be next week. Uh, don't get used to this weekly thing, it just happened this way. Um, when uh, we will be hosting uh, Amherst College's Javier Corrales again, he's been a very popular speaker in the future. He will be uh, speaking June 30th, again, 12:15 on um, populism in politics in Latin America, Europe, and the United States. So thank you again, Masa, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much, Sid, and thank you World Affairs Council for having me again. It's always great to be here with all of you.